Right now, today, on Explorador, you can travel to Africa to watch gorillas at a sanctuary or elephants at a watering hole. From there, you could travel to Panama to watch birds in a tropical forest, or Costa Rica, where wildlife veterinarians and rehabbers work to rewild orphaned sloths and toucans. In North America, you could move across the continent from east to west by greeting Atlantic puffins at sunrise on the main coast, then take a boat tour to watch beluga whales in northern Manitoba or watch migrating birds along the Mississippi River. You can later see sunset over an eagle's nest on the Pacific coast before settling on a small river in Katmai National Park, Alaska to watch brown bears fishing for salmon. As the world's largest live nature cam network, Explorador.org hosts cameras that stream footage from many areas across the planet. Installing and maintaining the cams as well as getting the footage online is challenging especially when the cameras broadcast from remote areas, such as Brooks River in Katmai National Park. That is home to our most popular webcam, the Brooks Falls Cam. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with explore.org. Today, we're talking about the tech of the bear cams and attempting to answer the question, how do they work? I'm talking with two guests today to help us learn more about that. First, let's welcome uh, Candace Rush. Explore.org's Director of New Media. Candice, great to have you along for the program today. How are you? Great. It is interesting to be on this side of a live chat, but uh, I'm happy to be here. And we're also joined by Joe Piper, Explore.org's Lead Field Technician. Joe, how are you doing today? Uh, doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. And uh, Joe, you just got back from, uh, I think, uh, an adventure at Bracken Cave in Texas, where you're setting up a new camp for us. Yeah, that's right. We uh, finally got two cameras online at this very remote cave that, you know, I've been struggling with for years at this point to get internet there. So we finally fixed that problem and just went live this morning. Yeah, I'm looking forward to after this chat, if the bats haven't emerged from the cave, I think that's going to be part of my evening plans to watch the bat watch there or the bat flight, excuse me. Uh, and both Candace and Joe are part of the small team dedicated uh, to working behind the scenes to make the bear cams and our other live cams on Explorador.org a, re a reality. In addition to the discussing the tech of the cams with them today, uh, we are also increasingly finding that webcams are an inspiration and a tool for many people around the world and also 
uh, in the study of wild animals. So we have an interview to share about the work being done to develop facial recognition technology for brown bears. Candace also has an update for us about upcoming changes to the commenting system on explore.org. So she'll be able to share that at the end of the program. We're going to try to answer your audience questions as well. So if you have questions for us about uh, the tech of the cams, drop those in the comments. Uh, Courtney from explore.org is searching for those right now, and she'll send those in our direction. We'll try to answer a few of those during the, the chat today. Uh, Joe, uh, I, I guess maybe my first couple of questions are for you, uh, because it, let's start with the basics. Let's let's start maybe like at Brooks River. Uh, what type of cameras are you using for the live cameras there? Sure. So, um, you know, we're we use IP security cameras um, primarily in all of our networks. Um, you know the. That's what we've been using since the inception of bear cams. Um, but you know, since since that time, that the engineering and technology behind these these pieces of hardware have drastically improved. So, you know, for for uh, the falls especially, we are constantly keeping um, the latest and greatest piece of technology that exists. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, they're just very high end. Um, excellent image quality, um, pan tilt zoom IP cameras. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are wondering about how they're powered. Brooks Camp, Brooks Camp in Katmai is off the grid. There are uh, diesel generators there that sort of power the lodge and the National Park Service infrastructure there. Uh, but how are you, you know, getting the bear camp signal um, out of that area. So how does it how does it get launched you know, to the rest of the world? Sure. Um, you know, we have um, the town of King Salmon is where our internet is um, basically landed. And we use Dumpling Mountain and a pair of repeater sites that are on top of that mountain. Both of those are off grid. Um, and then from there, we kind of uh, spread, basically spread out the signal throughout the camp from on top of the mountain. So we've got a uh, lower river, and um, that portion is powered by the generator on campsite, the same generator that provides power for like the Brooks Lodge. Um, and then at the falls, we have our own off-grid system that's solar and batteries, and just scaled, um, you know, large enough to be able to support the load that uh, that we have there with the three cameras um a couple wi-fi access points you know it's it's not a not a terribly huge load or anything but um you know it's something that we i'd say we do a little overkill on the battery bank to give us as much time as possible to keep it live um yeah, and that's just the, uh, and then a dumpling, that dumpling camera, that's just powered from the same off-grid system that powers the radios. And it's, uh, you know, it's every time I look at that, if I have to open up one of those boxes, and hopefully I don't, usually that means there's something wrong. Yes. <laughs> so I'll just be looking at a bunch of, a bunch of guts there that I maybe don't understand. <laughs> but every time I look those up, I look in there, I see that it, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing to me that they work. Uh, the, you know, the huge amount of batteries that are in those boxes to power the cameras. Um, and I think many people are thankful that uh, that we have that for cloudy days and in weather where there's not a lot of sunshine hitting those solar panels. Uh, Candice, uh, you know, a lot of people also wonder about like internet speed and and bandwidth regarding the cameras. And one of the main hiccups for bear cam sort of historically going back to like when it uh, first began running in 2012, one of the main hiccups hasn't been uh, necessarily internet speed, but internet bandwidth. So how have you coped with that issue and maybe address that issue um, this year, especially? Right. So I guess uh, to clarify, maybe the distinction you're making here, it's not that we used to have uh, 20 megabits upload speed, which for remote Alaska is fa fantastic, but we have eight cameras and the media rangers. So the capacity there gets used up 
very quickly, especially since for a really good HD stream, you'd love to be streaming at three megabits a second for each camera, eight cameras, like you're, you're gonna eat through that 20 megs almost immediately. Um, so longtime viewers of BearCam know this. They've noticed the frame rates and the weird highlight drops. And uh, we used to have to turn off one or two cameras during the live chats um, because we were just at capacity all the time. So for the Rangers to be able to connect to the internet, we had to turn off a camera. I usually chose the underwater camera. And so that would go down just so we could free up two megs for the Rangers to be able to talk. So um, this year, Joe really accomplished a number of things so that we could free up a lot of bandwidth to do a lot more. And then we also did a lot more server side, essentially, so that we weren't eating up as much bandwidth. So the two main successes this year are one, we moved a three cameras over to Starlink. So now we have two internet connections there. We've got the GCI connection and a Starlink connection so that um, we just have more capacity and redundant capacity so that if something happens to GCI, this, we still have Starlink so that we still have something going on at Brooks Camp and vice versa. Starlink goes down, we still have the GCI connection and all things media redundancy is fantastic. The other thing we did is for a very long time uh, for the camera controls, um, we had a high def stream that went to YouTube and then we had a lower resolution stream that the camera operators were consuming. So we had to have an extra set of bandwidth for the camera controls themselves. And so um, Zach, who is our amazing backend developer, has been working really, really hard to develop a system that will pull one stream from the camera and split one HD feed to the camera controls and one HD feed to YouTube server side so that we're only taking one connection to the camera. And so we accomplished that this year as well, which freed up probably another two or three megs um, off of the network. So you're really like fighting for just things that you wouldn't think about like in regular developed areas, like one or two megabits, like you're not gonna fight for that at home, but in Alaska, like all of that makes a little difference so that we can increase camera quality and speeds and reliability. And a, a, an audience question that came in that's sort of related to that, Candace, is uh, was about the re reliability of satellite versus like a, a traditional mm -hmm. internet service provider. And this person wrote in asking, uh, I know a couple of the CAMs are using satellite this year. Has any assessment been done on the reliability of that versus an ISP? And if it's mm -hmm. more reliable, would they all go to satellite at some point? Um, in CatMy especially, I'm hesitant to sort of put all of our eggs in one basket. Um, so I, I do like having a sort of a diversity of connections, but at the end of the season, I basically will pull all of the logs and just look at the stats on like how often stuff is connected to see which one was more or less reliable. Um, you'll see drops for both GCI and, this, and the Starlink connections. Uh, Starlink, I think, tends to be a little shorter drops than GCIs tend to be, but I mean, I think that's just anecdotal at this point until I can pull the logs at the end of the season, we won't know for sure, but that's like, that's a fantastic question. And I am, I will have an answer probably in September or October, yeah. Joe, a lot of people wonder about uh, the power system for the cams. And I know you mentioned a little bit about that just a, a few moments ago, but maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into that. Uh, so how are the, the cams, uh, powered overall you know you mentioned there's maybe like an off-grid system for this but can you um give us a, a few more details on that yeah so you know we've always had an off-grid system at the falls um so we have a you know it's basically an oversized solar panels with a battery bank system and then all of our devices just are powered off of that battery bank um we've got a battery bank in there that in theory should sustain everything for about four and a half days if the sun never comes up for that long um and then we also have the ability if, if there is for some reason some i don't know freak situation where there is no sun for that long we can turn things off and on remotely just to reduce the load just to um at least you know elongate the life of the system and and at least keep a heartbeat there so we can always come back to it whenever the sun comes back up. I'd say like maybe a volcanic eruption would be the only thing that might cause something like that. Um, 
but it would have to be like a pretty significant event because even even uh the weather there when it's overcast and it just kind of looks pretty dreary out we're still getting power because we have a a very large uh solar array there um you know that that system is the most challenging one just because it has that larger power load um the the mountain sites at this point we've reduced the power load on those two repeater sites to absolutely the bare minimum uh, just because we want it to be as easy to power as possible so each one of those um you know also has an overkill battery bank and overkill um for solar you know this year we were we've we've never accomplished um going into a new season where those two systems come back online automatically um this year we were the closest ever where it was one ethernet switch port away from coming back online and then i could see oh yeah everything's still there everything looks great um you know i'm not completely blind going into this year so we're very 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 close um power wise both just both of those repeater sites were powered up when i got up there which has never happened especially at the summit um so that was a an accomplishment for this year um you know we have a we have a return trip in september that's when we convert lower river to an off-grid system because they shut down the generator on the campsite once you know basically once camp is shut down so that'll be i don't know somewhere around september 18th or 19th somewhere in that area um but when we get there you know that's some of the solar panels and whatnot that we hang off of the uh, railing and then we install the box with the batteries and everything um, and then we remove that next june when the generator kicked back but that system again is oversized um, and for that one you know we can only run the south side cameras just because the north side's just too far um, and it you know really in reality to get the north side up i'd have to put another power system over on the north side um but yeah that's uh i mean i guess that's about that's about it well there's there's certainly a lot to that and i hope that answers a couple of audience questions that came in somebody uh wrote pretty early on are there are the solar panels only on the treehouse near the falls are there others along the river so the only permanent ones like joe said along the river are at the treehouse the others uh down at the lower uh, part of Brooks River. So our river watch camera, our underwater camera, and our cat's uh, view cam, those are powered by the, the generators that uh, power power Brooks Lodge uh, there. Yes. And then also uh, a, a quick viewer question that we can answer real quick here, um, just to give people maybe a bit more context, is how many cameras are there near the falls and where they're located? There's three cameras near the falls themselves that are powered by that big uh, solar panel system, the Brooks Falls main camera that we have, the Falls Low camera and the Riffles camera. So those are all sort of on the same um, system there. And yeah. um, Candace, what what happens, um, you know, we get we get this signal out of, of Brooks Camp. So the cameras are working well, the power system's working well due to, to Joe's hard work. Uh, what happens once the camera feed reaches servers on the internet? What has to happen before you can actually send those things live? Um. So when we start up the season, we leave them on for several days to make sure that we're getting the bandwidth we expect to do. Uh, the camera operators spend those days training and our amazing camera op admins are redoing presets and tours and anything that needs to be adjusted based on anything that's happened uh, to the cameras themselves. This year we had a bunch of new cameras, so they spent all that time setting up brand new presets and brand new tours and uh, every camera's got its own little quirks. So they they were doing that early June. Um, and then we have uh, several steps of servers that it goes to before it gets to YouTube. So we've got uh, one, one server that ingests the camera feed. Um, and then we've got another server that basically says like, is server one live? Yes, go live to YouTube. Is server one not live? Play our highlight reel. 
And that's sort of the logic that's happening when you get the live highlight switching. Um, and then after that, it just goes uh, straight to YouTube. Then also, you know, it's, it's um, you know, th there's so much that happens behind the scenes. There's so much that happens on site, but it, it takes a lot of coordination and planning, uh, mm -hmm. especially for like a cam installation process. So uh, how, how do you, the both of you go about doing that? Uh, thinking specifically about cam installation, especially in a place like Brooks River, which is is so remote. Um, Joe, maybe I'll, I'll ask you first that, you know, so sure. what's your planning process like? And then we can get um, Candace's uh, ideas on that. Sure. So, it, um, you know, it pretty much starts in January, I would say. And the very first task is looking at if anything failed from the year before, um, you know, those are going to be the high priority items that absolutely have to get taken care of. Um, camera failures, degraded wireless links, um, failing power systems, maybe old, uh, like say old batteries would be something that would be an item that you have to address. Um, but basically kind of looking at the known issues that we know, and that's where you start. And then, you know, we, we plan that out. Um, you know, once once we have that planned out, we determine if there's any upgrades that we want to do, like kind of a wish list of, uh, you know, what what are things that we can do to improve the system. Um, you know, what kind of hardware is available for that, and it, you know, are we able to get our hands on it? For example, you know, upgrading the false high camera this year to the eight megapixel camera, <clears throat> um, and then like we upgraded all the lower river cameras last year. Um, and then we did uh, cats for review this year. Um, you know, once once we determine those kind of wish list items, uh, then we look at you know any new technology that will improve the overall system or give us some redundancy or some advantages or make our lives easier, the rangers' lives easier when it comes to supporting this. Um, and overall, we're looking for more uptime with the streams. Uh, you know, this year, a big uh, obvious one is installing Starlink at on campsite. Like that, you know, has opened up literally an ocean of possibility and um, and provided us with just the, the redundant internet uh, ability on this network. Like if something goes down in the past, we are sitting back and waiting for it to come back up. Now it's like I can actually, I have a, basically a back door always in, from either side into this entire network. Um, we can switch, we can um, redirect streams to go over either circuit with some very quick and simple configurations on the devices. So we have like plan B, plan C in place at this point for um, problems when they come up, you know. Um, you know, more to actually, you know, talking about Starlink to answer some the question earlier, you know, we are very much still in the, I would say, testing phase um, and watching the performance um, of Starlink. And so far, in my opinion, it's been phenomenal. Um, you know, once we have all of that planned out, then kind of logistics, uh, how do we get all the hardware up to, Brooks, you know, the shipping, the, you know, the weight, um, figuring out how do we get it from King Salmon to Brooks? Who's going to, who's going to take it? Are the park service folks going to help us out or do we have to, you know, figure something else out? Um, so that's all, you know, towards the end, I'd say that's more in May when we're getting closer to the early June. Um, and then, you know, the last thing is just simply booking travel with flights, hotels, float planes, helicopters, boats, um, just just lining all that up. So by the time we show up, you know, we're just kind of following the bouncing ball of what we already planned out and everything and, and not really having any surprises. This is the overall goal. And what about you, Candace? What's the planning <laughs> process like from your end of things? Um, you heard all of what Joe does, which is a lot. Um, so I try my best to uh, 
take stuff off of his plate wherever possible. If that involves following up about compliance things or coordinating with partners around timing, scheduling meetings, keeping track of stuff, I try to pick up some of the more like bureaucratic things so that he doesn't have to if I possibly can. Um, the other thing that I do is I work with our whole web engineering team because once bear season hits, we sort of have a, a major code freeze. We don't do a lot of huge releases to the websites or a lot of upgrades during bear season. It's our prime season. We don't need the website crashing <laughs> the moment Otis shows up. So um, I work with them to make sure that we're sort of like good to go for all of our, I'm sorry, my dog has been crying this whole time. I apologize for her. Um, <laughs> well, on, maybe uh, your dog wants to be on camera. She wants to if you can see her ear right there. Um, yeah, so so I work with them to make sure that we're all good to go there. Um, and so that we don't need to make sure that we don't need to push anything out that might possibly interfere with the website or bear cam. Um, I'm also coordinating with the cam off admin team to make sure that um, they're ready to go. They know their timeline for when the cameras are going to come online, when they can start training um, and sort of tangentially also with like the social team to make sure that they've got install photos and sort of anything they might need to help do promotion and all that sort of stuff as well. So I spend a lot of time just sort of like filling in and coordinating for people um, to uh, make the process as, as smooth as possible. And getting the, the bear cams working in a typical year is, is often difficult. It requires, uh, it sounds like from the both of you, a significant uh, commitment from time or in time and energy. Uh, and, and Joe, I'm interested to hear from you about a little bit about your adventures at Brooks Camp this year. So you were at Brooks Camp in early June, setting up the system and, and um, adding upgrades and things like that. So what challenges do, do you experience uh, this year? Um, well, this year going into it, um, I'd say the biggest challenge, well, you know, I, as always, was that dumpling was down. I did not know the state of the repeater sites. Um, I had also heard that it was an unusually um, heavy snowfall um, in, in basically mm -hmm. that area. Um, so, you know, when I hear those things, I kind of keep in the back of my mind, well, there's always the possibility that, you know, it's just glaciered over right now, or, um, you know, maybe it was a really particularly nasty winter up there and it physically damaged say one of the stands and it's just laying there on its side or it's in pieces and it's just a, you know. Which has happened before. There. Yes. So, you know, that, that, that's a big kind of, usually the biggest thing is what's the state of those repeater sites? Because if it's very damaged, that significantly changes what we have to do when we're there. It changes all, you know, hardware and tools that we have, have to take up to the mountain. Um, but if, you know, if we know that, oh, it's still there and it just looks just like it did last year, then it's like, okay, that's fine. We know we don't have to take a bunch of extra hardware and tools and whatnot. So this year, you know, we the minute we got to King Salmon, we did a flyby on a helicopter just to look and say, okay, yes, they are there. It is not a huge glacier. We can hike, you know, we can actually make it to them, to the uh, repeater sites. Um, you know, one of the things from this year is some of the maintenance crew did try to hike the mountain, I think in May, but they only made it so far before they were in waist deep snow on the trail. And I was like, oh, well, that's going to be an issue, you know, when we get there, if that's still the case. So that was another thing we were looking at, like, can we even hike up to the mountain and make it there? Um, you know, so other than that, you know, there, you know, this year went, as as far as Brooks goes, very smooth and very according to plan. Um, but yeah, that was uh, like I said earlier, we were just one failed switch port away from having no blind spots, which would have. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for, you know, next year. Yeah, fingers fingers crossed for that. And, yeah, and uh, a follow up question. Um, Joe, about that. It was somebody was wondering about that hike up uh, Dumpling Mountain. So um, they were, sounds like you did go up there at least, hike up there at least once, but um, somebody did write in and ask, does Joe have to hike up that big mountain to maintain the camps for Katmai National Park? If so, how often? So when you're at Brooks Camp, you know, maybe there for a week or, or two, how often did you go up this, this last trip? Uh, well, we went up twice. Um, 
this last trip. Um, typically, there is at least two trips. Um, usually, the the first trip is to go up and meet the helicopter and do the battery swap. Um, and then a lot of times, like if we're, say we're going to upgrade dumpling cam or something like that, usually I'll just, instead of trying to smash everything into one day, because it can be a lot, um, you just kind of split it up. And it's also very good, you know, exercise to do it within like a five or six day period. Um, but, um, you know, this year, the first hike that we did, the wind was insane. I mean, it was probably gusts of up to 60 miles an hour. So that made it very challenging. The sling loads, it, the wind made it very challenging for the helicopter. Um, but I had never seen it as windy as it was this year. It was almost comical um, how how nasty it was up there. <laughs> um and then when we hiked, I think we hiked it the very next day and it was beautiful and perfect out, you know, which that happens all the time where one day is super, you know, you probably shouldn't hike the mountain, but we have to because <laughs> that's the schedule. And then the next day it's just absolutely beautiful and it's definitely more of a pleasure hike than anything else. And, and Candace, earlier you mentioned about, um you know, during when you finally get the bear cam signal, you want to make sure that it's sort of stable and ready to go out to the to the rest of the world. So can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that, uh, such as what considerations must you consider before pushing a camera's stream mm -hmm. live to the Internet? Yeah, this year was perhaps the smoothest turn up we've ever had. Generally, the first week, week and a half bear cams are live. Um, I'm on the phone with Joe potentially like every other day being like, oh man, like I can't even get one meg up from this camera. Like something's happened and he goes and readjusts the radio and we try it then. And I'm like tweaking all the different bandwidth on the cameras to see like how high I can get it before it starts to stutter and drop frames and uh, be a general problem. <laughs> um, I have the camera operators like open all of the controls, like what's it going to look like when every single control is open and it's all moving. Um, and uh, this year was the first year that I sort of just like we did it. I was like, all right, plug the, plug the, turn on the servers, monitor the bandwidth and everything sort of came in at the bandwidth I expected it to. Uh, you want a straight line on that graph all the way across. You don't want to see a bunch of up and down. <laughs> that's not what you want. And that's what we saw. We just saw a bunch of straight lines, camera operators opened the controls, moved them, um, no blips. And I think a lot of that came down to um, uh, the work we did, Joe did. Uh, one ongoing effort to stabilize the network, Starlink as well. Earlier in the season, you probably did notice there was some freezing on the cameras and some amount of drops is always to be expected with RTSP feeds. Um, but that that had to do with, with some hiccups server side. Uh, right when bear cams were going live, Amazon also did a bunch of updates. And also we were testing some new stuff on the HD controls. Uh, and also there was, I think, some uh, radio issues. It was sort of like the several things happened at once to cause a bunch of freezes. So we did some troubleshooting in the first couple weeks of bear cam, got a lot of that stuff sorted. Um, and since then, I, they've been pretty stable. And a, 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 uh, maybe a follow-up question to this, and this could go to, to, um, to, to both of you, but maybe Candace, you can talk about it uh, mm -hmm. first. Because the cameras, many of the cameras we have at Brooks River have the capacity to stream at 4K. But that's not what we're, you know, pushing out to the to the no. public. Can you, so you can just talk about why um, you don't use 4K because that's a that's an audience question that came in. I would. We are setting up a lot of our cameras across the Explore network to one day be able to stream at 4K, but um, we still do have limited bandwidth. And to get a good 4K stream, you're going to want eight megabits upload speed minimum probably 12 or 13 to get something really nice. Um, and that would just eat the whole thing up with one camera. Um, so we don't do that. What we do for Brooks Falls is um, we bring it in locally 4K into a computer so I can re record 4K on a local computer at Katmai. Uh, and then we sort of downscale it to 1080 and that's what we end up uploading. So, um, I'll be I'll be manually recording 4K stuff. So if you see any 4K stuff on YouTube, that's how that happens is we're manually recording locally and then I'm uploading footage later, but a live stream at 4k is just 
just out of reach from a bandwidth perspective. Uh, H.265 is looking really good. SRT also potentially there's some some different streaming codecs we might be able to work with that could lower that that bandwidth requirement so that we might be able to stream at 4K. Um, and I think that's that's probably one of our big goals for the end of this year and next year is to get at least one 4K stream out to YouTube. So be on the lookout. I'll be very excited. Joe, a, a, an audience question too about the cameras is about the, the, the little wipers on them. Somebody did notice that there's a wiper on the Brooks Falls camera. Uh, do the other cameras there have, have little wipers? Maybe you can talk about that, that feature of them. Sure. So um, let's see. All the lower river cameras have those and um, falls high and riffles. So um, I mean, it's a feature that's just happens to be part of that camera configuration, which, you know, when I saw it, I was like, oh, bonus, there's a little wiper on it that, you know, that's one less phone call that I have to make or one less Slack message to, a, you know, a um, ranger to tell him to go out there with a, you know, some, some lens cleaner and a microfiber cloth and wipe things off. So, you know, it's very convenient, very nice to have. Um, and we've always had some iteration of self-cleaning. We, you know, in, in the past, we've had a third party um, enclosure that did have self-cleaning capabilities. Um, but it was yet another piece of hardware that you're putting a camera inside. So having this kind of these cameras as an all in one, um, it's very nice and it just simplifies um, the overall complexity of the entire network. And I can remember many, many days where somebody was like, hey, the, the camera is covered in spider webs or something like mm -hmm. that. Go like, can you go up there and clean it? And then I would go there and get caught up in something else and I would forget. Uh, the one camera <laughs> maybe that doesn't have that right now is the underwater camera. So rangers still have to get into the water and with a scrub brush to clean the underwater camera so they can't reach that directly uh, from it. And uh, for Candace, I, for now. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. For now, yeah, for now. For now. Oh, okay. I was just, just <laughs> yeah, we're, that's in, that's, that's in the works. That's on the wish list as well. Yeah, self cleaning underwater enclosure. That's the dream, guys. That's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that, and I, I bet the Rangers yeah. who are, are tasked today with cleaning it look forward to yeah. that too. I didn't mind doing it, but it was one of those things. that's like when you, when you're a park ranger. Your, your capacity for extra duties is already like at its max. You're probably already doing too many things than you're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing. So eliminating those, those little details mm -hmm. from their workload, um, I think is, is something to strive for from our- Well, from and our I'm not sure it's a little detail either. Cause like they have to, it takes two people. There are brown bears in the river. They have to like get in a canoe. Right, like it's like a, it's a whole production. <laughs> it's not simple to clean that camera. So, so yeah. We want that. It's also not not too simple to drive the cameras, uh, Candice. Uh, so what kind of interface do the camera operators have and how do the, the camera operators control the cameras? Yeah, so uh, every different IP camera on the market has their own custom web interface um, and they're all different. <laughs> and so we didn't want camera operators logging directly into the camera, one extra load on the network security, all the rest of it. So uh, we, over the course of several years, developed our own backend camera control system. And it is uh, sort of a unified system where it's got one interface, it's got a little square like pan tilt zoom sort of arrow situation and a zoom bar on the side. So we bring in the camera feed um, and they just control it like a joystick. They control it from their computers. All you need is an internet connection and a web browser. Uh, you probably could do it on a phone, although it's not optimized for mobile. Um, but yeah, so so we have the camera feed come in and they've got a little up, right, down, left, right, diagonal joystick situation um, and a zoom bar. And that's how they control it. And it is pretty close to real time. Uh, the camera controls are about 90 seconds ahead of what Explore eventually sees. Um, so camera operators are like very critical in notifying us of any happenings because they're seeing it first uh, before anybody else sees it on the website. Um, but yeah, Zach also manages that. I can't say enough. He does amazing work on that system to keep it as up to date and as usable for the camera operators as possible. 
And thanks to our volunteer camera operators who made webcam experiences possible. We always have open positions for camera operators for all of our, basically all of our live cams. So if you are interested in that, you can go to explore.org slash volunteer uh, and fill out that form and, and we'll get back to you with more information. We've learned a lot uh, from Candace and Joe so far about the work that is needed uh, to make the cams cameras operate and the challenges that they need to overcome to make the, the bear cams a reality in Katmai. Uh, we've also seen many examples of how the bear cams are supposed to protect and study wildlife. So we're going to take a break from interviewing uh, Joe in just a moment to talk about one of those aspects, and that is the Bear ID project. Earlier this year, I interviewed Ed Miller, who is one of the developers of the Bear ID project. And so let's hear what he has to say about that, that program. Hi, everyone. Mike Fitz here with explore.org, and I'm with Ed Miller, who's part of the Bear ID project team, to give us a little bit of an update on Bear ID and a special Bear Cam companion app that he is working on. So Ed, thanks for being here. It's great to talk with you once again. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Uh, so yeah, we've talked before about the Bear ID project, um, but for maybe people who aren't familiar with it, can you just give us a quick overview of what that is? Sure, yeah. The Bear ID project is a, an attempt to develop a software application using AI and machine learning uh, to detect and uh, identify individual bears from photos and from video footage uh, for use in uh, research around the world. And you are, uh, uh, you know, you're not only developing this, but you're also uh, a bear cam fan. So you've watched the webcams, you watch them when you're at home. So maybe uh, you can tell me a little bit more about what inspired the, the Bear ID project. Yeah, when I first started getting into machine learning, uh, I was taking some classes some years ago. It was around the same time I started watching the Bear ID, uh, so the, watching the Bear Cams, and uh, I was looking for a project to work on for uh, to help develop my machine learning skills a little bit more. And uh, as I was watching the cams and learning from the community uh, how to identify all the bears, I thought, oh, well, if, if I can learn this, then surely a computer must be able to learn this. And so I just started working on this as a fun project uh, and then met up with some researchers and found out that they, they really need these kinds of tools. And you're also working specifically on something that has to do with the bear cams, because there's a lot of different applications for this technology yeah. in the future. But one thing that you are focused on right now is the bear cam companion app. So what's, right. what's that? Yeah, so um, the bear cam companion, the idea there is to, uh, so the bear, bear ID project uses face identification and we mostly trained it with photos in really high resolution trail cameras where the bears are really close and get good facial profiles. And on the bear cams, we don't really get that as well, um, both because of the bandwidth limitations, but also the bears aren't posing and, and putting their faces <laughs> in the cameras very often. Um, so when we wanted to be able to identify bears on the cam, and so what we're trying to do now is develop a new algorithm that can identify bears from their full body or, or maybe from some other characteristics, and to do that, we need labeled data. And labeled data in this case is images of the bears, uh, detect, detecting them where they are in the image, and then being able to label those individuals. And so we've built the Bear Cam Companion to be a site, a website where you can go and see these uh, snapshots from the, the cam. They're actually taken from the snapshot gallery every 10 minutes right now, hopefully more often later. And you can log on to that site. You can see the latest images. If you uh, know who is in the photos, somebody can identify it. And then the idea is to use those identifications to start building an algorithm to, to teach the machine how to identify them. So yeah, we're trying to teach the machine, but you need a lot of help to do that, right? So yes. how can people, you know, maybe contribute to the project? Yeah, so really it's it's log on. If you see images of bears that you recognize, um, there's, you know, you should see a box around each of the bears. Uh, if you click on the the box, uh, the, the label above it, you should be able to see a drop down in, in, with all the bears that are known uh, on the river. Uh, select which bear it is and, um, really that's that's the main thing you'll, you'll be helping us out 
And if you, um, even if you see somebody's already labeled it, label it again, because we're trying to use group consensus. So the more people that label it consistently with the same ID, if they're confident in that, then uh, the, the better the data is going to be. And even if you're not fam that familiar with bears, you can go there and see what the rest of the community is doing and, and start to learn yourself. And what are the, the next steps uh, that we're, that you're hoping to achieve in, the, in that project? So we are definitely uh, want to create this model that can identify bears from the bear cam. And then one of the things this can also help us do for research is to take some of these models and start building them into the camera devices themselves. Okay. So they can be used in remote locations uh, where there's not good Wi-Fi or uh, explore.org cams that have <laughs> uh, uh, data back to, back to the internet. Um, and it will, um, yeah, be able to identify, detect and identify the bear right on the camera and then send some low bandwidth data back through cellular or satellite or something similar saying this bear was at this location at this time, uh, maybe a small snapshot or something along those lines. And uh, this gives us a lot more real time data because today the researchers pretty much put their cameras out in the, in the spring leave them out all summer, come back and get them in the fall, and then spend all winter manually going through all the data. So it's a lot of work. It is, it's <laughs> a lot of work and it's, it's very delayed from when any actions actually happen. And the, the other ways that they're tracking bears in the wild is basically more invasive, like putting a collar on them and tracking them that way. So you have to tranquilize the bear and, and, um, and then figure out based on its, its locations, what it's doing, but you have to handle the bear. So this is a much more, uh, this is a technique that would be non-invasive and I think it would be uh, widely utilized by people once we can kind of fine tune that, uh, that, that information and effort. Yes, exactly. Uh, so where can people go who want to help? Where, what, what's the website that they can help on that? Yeah, so okay. it's app.bearid.org. That's app.bearid.org. Um, and that website currently is, is being sponsored by AWS. I get credits through uh, the, the AWS Heroes program that I'm in there. Um, so AWS is helping to pay to, to run this, this site at, at this point. Um, yeah, that, that's really it. And from there, there's links back to the Bear ID project if you want to learn more. Awesome. All right. Well, Ed, thanks for uh, joining me and giving us an update on the Bear ID project. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks again to Ed Miller for his time to explain the potential of facial recognition technology for bears. And like he said, if you want to help with that effort, please go to app.bearid.org. Or if you simply want to learn more, check out bearresearch.org. We're going to get to some um, audience questions uh, in just a moment. I know there's there's several of them that we're going to try to answer before the end of our broadcast today. But there's a, there's a, a, an update uh, on a, a, a uh, I guess an upgrade in a sense to the uh, explore website uh, that I want to give Candace the opportunity uh, to talk about at least briefly and talk about where we are in that, in that mm -hmm. process uh, because the bear camps first went live in 2012 and, and each year we've worked to make the experience better. One of the big developments that explore.org is working on right now is a new comment system. So Candace, could you uh, please give us an update on that effort? Yeah, so last fall, you, uh, a lot of you guys know I put out a survey that sort of asked what you guys would want to see out of a new comment system. Um, we've had discussed for a long time, but uh, it's no secret that it's had its glitches. The newest and I would say worst one so far is that it's banning people arbitrarily. We didn't do it. Discuss is doing it. I'm very sorry. If it says you're banned, you might not be. Please email feedback. We'll get that figured out. So. Uh, we then endeavored to sort of sort through that survey and build something that would work for our community. Um, and so currently, um, I have some notes, uh, we are very close to being able to go into beta testing. So when we go into beta testing sometime late August, early September, you will need an explore.org account to comment. So if you're currently commenting under a discuss account only, please make sure you hit that join button on the top of explore and create an explored order account so you can participate in the new comment system. 
Uh, we'll be beta testing on one or two sort of medium traffic cameras for several months. And during that time, we will need, need, need you guys to give us all the feedback you possibly can. Um, tell us what, what's working, what's not working for you, what you'd like to see. Our goal here really is to build something that works for the community. Um, and so we have a couple new features I'm very, very excited to talk about. The first one is um, what we've called our off-topic filter. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so uh, you'll be able to mark a comment as off topic directly in the thread. As you see right there, there's a little checkbox off topic. Um, and then individuals can decide if they do or do not want to see off topic comments. Explored our community was split 50 50 right down the center about if they wanted or did not want off topic comments. And so I thank you all for being very patient using that off topic comment board right now while we're on discuss. But in the future, um, people will be able to make their own choice about how they want to interact with the comments. If you want to talk about your dinner and uh, how your weekend was, mark that off topic. People who don't want to see that stuff can filter it out. People who do, can filter it in. We've also got a very fun hashtag filter. So for everybody wanting to know when Otis showed up, you can just search hashtag Otis and all of the stuff that's been tagged with Otis will show up so you can see what's there. We've got a bunch of other filters, mod only filters, um, date and time filters, that kind of stuff. Um, we've also got reactions. That was a really big suggestion in the survey was to, to let people react to comments. Um, we've got uh, a lot of really, fantastic stability improvements. Um, so when you post a snapshot to comments, it will post to comments right away. Discuss won't be marking it as spam. Your account won't be banned arbitrarily. Your notifications will work. All of the sort of stuff that that is working off and on on Discuss, our goal is to create a stable comment system that works for our community and the way we use it. So look out, I'll uh, have a probably more thorough update about the beta test, how you can comment, how you can sign up um, in the next couple of weeks, but we are very, very excited to share it with you. Um, it's been a long road and uh, the team working on it has uh, worked very hard and very proud of them. Well, thanks for that update. I have been in sort of like the, uh, the pre-beta testing, trying to break the alpha. It, um, for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a, I guess alpha is before beta, right? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for yeah. That. <laughs> that's that's legitimately what it is. You're in the alpha. We have also 20 moderators right now in there trying to break it as well. Um, they're doing their best, uh, and they've pointed out some really fantastic quality of life features already that we're working on right now. Um, so yeah, you've been very helpful, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm excited to uh, to see that in action for the public uh, coming up soon and. And thanks again for to Joe and Candace for their time sharing their expertise about the bear cams. We have a few minutes left in our broadcast today, so we're going to try to get to a couple of audience questions here uh, quickly. Uh, Joe, I'll, I'll toss this one to you. Um, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head. This one is about volts and, and amps uh, in the system at the bear cam. So somebody was wondering how many volts and amps is in the system, how many watts is in the solar system? Uh, so at the falls, it's a 24 volt system. 